episode 33 nowhere near stopping this episode is incredible it's with sunil godsey the intuition expert if you haven't followed your intuition you probably have some regret about certain situations like that my intuition was telling me yes i said no and i lost out on a big opportunity we want to make sure that we tune in and understand intuition and how it's speaking to us individually uh, we've got a special treat for you at the end with an awesome challenge that sunil has provided for us uh, make sure to do that it is incredible leave a review help us get in front of more people like yourself thanks so much guys let's go ahead and get started so we are back with another episode of the dedication to excellence podcast today we have the expert in all things intuition sunil godsey on the show thank you for stopping by brother no oh, thanks for having me as, as, as a guest i'm really uh, happy to be here and hoping to educate your list your listeners on the intricacies of intuition and why trusting it is going to help you make the right decision every single time. Look, I love our listeners, but with all due respect, screw our listeners. This is going to be a <laughs> private session because here's the deal. With the subject of intuition, my intuition tells me that a lot of people in my life are on some bullshit. So I want you to help me unpack that. And we can, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally kidding. Listeners, love you. This is for you too. But, but your, your knowledge on the subject is vast. It is deep. Uh, before we get into it, though, which I'm definitely excited to do, why don't you go ahead and give us your backstory and tell us how you even got into the field of intuition? Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the real catalyst for this came from when uh, right after I wrote my first book called Fail Fast, Succeed Faster. And the premise behind that book was really about uh, interviewing business executives and entrepreneurs and to really showcase. So if I wrote a book on their their hurdles or their their failures, then the idea is if you're if you read that book and you learn from their hurdles and failures, then you should theoretically be able to succeed faster because you're not going to repeat those. And so when I used to go speak on stages, one of the things that I kept getting asked by entrepreneurs is, Sunil, tell me the one thing that's going to take me to success. And so I kind of rolled my eyes. Like I, I have this 400 page book. I've already interviewed <laughs> 300 people and there's 75 stories. Like if, if this was a one pager, like this would be a PDF, right? And I, I wouldn't be speaking to you. So the one tip is read his book, people. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I was just thinking, why do people keep asking me this question until I went back to the audio recordings? And when I went back to the audio recordings, 80 to 90% of the business executives or entrepreneurs use some form of, I ignored my intuition. I ignored my gut. I should have, I knew what the right decision is. I should have, could have. And I really got intrigued as to what is this thing called intuition that these business executives seem to ignore that is really the premise of my 400 pages in my book. And that got me really thinking, okay, when did intuition kind of hit me? And so I remember when I was five years old, there was these video games that I wanted to buy. It was one of the first videos games that came on the market. And they were, I think it was $79.99. And so, you know, uh, and I remember this voice distinctly telling me at five years old, Sunil, go door to door to raise money. Let's and go. that's what I did. I went door to door and I raised $200. $100 went to my dad and the under $100, $100 went to charity because that was my, what my school is doing. I felt really good about that. So I remember that was my first brush with intuition. And then I remember three incidences that I really got, uh, you know, when I ignored my intuition. One of the first one was, uh, you know, I'm a South Asian male. And so there's four doors, career doors that are open to us, uh, which is doctor, lawyer, engineer, or failure. <laughs> um, and, and so I picked door number three, which was engineering. My dad was an engineer, even though my intuition was saying you were an, you're meant to be an entrepreneur. All these breadcrumbs in my life were all entrepreneurial in nature. Yet I followed, uh, you know, I drank the East Indian Kool-Aid and I became an engineer and hated it. Uh, in year two of engineering, I got a chance to become a part-time investor in a Mexican restaurant chain. And pretty soon I was making five times in dividends than I was working, than making full-time as an engineer. And so at some point, something had to snap. Uh, and my intuition got so loud that it finally, I said, I'm going to quit. I lost my relationship with my dad, which was the one thing that was keeping me there. But it was a necessary thing I, that had to go. And then, man, I got into one venture after another, $20 million in revenues, wholesale clothing, retail clothing, restaurants, uh, the pop-up events, entertainment company. And I loved it. And it was just, it was on a, so an emotional high being an entrepreneur. Eventually morphed into management consulting. And then one of the contracts I got was a huge contract in Silicon Valley. And they were going to pay me just oodles of cash. But what was the problem was that the contract terms kept changing. And again, there's this something that was telling me back away. Mm. 
but I ignored that something. And I ended up going down to Silicon Valley, spent every single penny and the company didn't pay me. And I came back up to Canada with 25 cents in my bank account. Uh, I'm about to get married. Luckily, my wife was in India at the time and she was, that's where she lived. That's where I met her. And we're supposed to get married in a couple of years. She's phoning me saying how things are going, honey. And I say, that's great. Great. Meanwhile, I don't even know where I'm going to be sleeping that night. And the last thing that happened was I remember I, I was in engineering. I was doing some personal coaching at the time. And I had a really good friend who was, she was being stalked at the time from some guy and she needed some advice on how to get rid of this guy, or at least, you know, get, how can she deal with it? And so again, something was telling me to meet with her that afternoon. It was really urgent that she, you need to speak to me, but, and I didn't have anything, you know, it was open yet. I said, you know what, let's meet a couple of days later. And the very next day, that same guy walked up to her, followed her to a bus shelter and a bullet, put a bullet in her forehead wow. and killed her. And now when I reflect back and say, oh, wow, I really got to understand what this thing called intuition is because I just found out the devastating situations that I went into by ignoring this. And so for me, I started thinking, okay, how do I think about intuition? And so, uh, you know, I, I went online and this is 2012-ish, 13-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking, okay, everything's talking about manifestation, voices from God, uh, you know, coming from the cosmos. And that didn't resonate with me. So if it resonates with other people, no problem. If they think that's where intuition comes from, that's fine. But that didn't sit with, well with me. I looked at some online definitions and that really didn't resonate with this kind of sort of, but it really wasn't. So I, what, I, what was, what was the gist of these definitions that you were seeing? So some of them, it's, it's something that goes against uh, a conscious reasoning, um, something that's quick thinking and not mm -hmm. uh, uh, a void of rational thought, um, and then of course there's some that's it's manifestation and voices of God. So they have all those. So there's all these sort of dictionary definitions and, and sort of the, the spiritual meditative type of de definitions. And so what was and, the main Delta for you? With, well, with I, I, I just thought of uh, as sort of like an art and science. So mm -hmm. I saw, I thought of it as, okay, so there's this art part, which are these some things, I don't know what these some things are, but they're all different. So what are these some things and why is like one a voice? And then something's like the back of my, my neck standing up or another one's like something feels off. Like, there's no consistency here. Sure. And so I'm looking for some thread of consistency and then, okay. So I'm, I like art and science. I think uh, there's your engineer background. It, there's my engineering in, right? coming in. If you look <laughs> at steel or something like that, there's, there's, there's the mass and there's the energy, right? And I really understood things from that perspective. And so I said, okay, well, what does the science have to say? And so I went into the academic research and tens of thousands of articles on intuition. There's MRIs and brain scans showing where it happens in the tr triggers in the frontal lobe. And here's the case. And so there, and there's, there's some things that are saying that intuition happens seven to 10 seconds before we actually make a decision or take an action. Mm -hmm. That was in 2013. A colleague was telling me that research coming out of university of Toronto is showing that that's as, as early as 23 seconds before we take an action or make a decision is where intuition hits. Uh, there was research showing that infants as young as two months old have been shown to have intuitive tendencies. It takes 14 seconds to trust someone. Um, and so, and the big thing where I, st where I couldn't find a definition, and here's the reason why is because intuition hits the primitive part of your brain, which is your amygdala. There's no language around it. Mm -hmm. It's feel, think, fear. That's it. And so no wonder I didn't have any language around or a definition because there's no definition. It's a feeling. And, and that's where intuition sits. And so now I kind of understood that. And so now, is there another scientific explanation? I looked in my uh, my social circle and lo and behold, there's a neurologist that I had as a colleague. And I said, can I interview you? Uh, he said, sure, come on down. And we turn on the camera and I said, does intuition exist? And he says, it absolutely does. And he goes into the, the research with the gut and how more and more research is coming out to say that it's it's much it happens much earlier than the actual uh, brain. We actually think about decisions. So he's confirming it. Uh, when he has his patients, they say something's up. It's up to him to use evidence-based medicine to believe his patients. And every single time, something is up. And so he concurs that there's this thing called intuition that we're getting to understand a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I, and then what I looked at the art part where these signals, what I found out is that there's there's these two inventories of signals. There's these things called positive signals and negative signals. Mm -hmm. The positive signals are the ones that actually move you forward, right? And so for me, 
uh, it's going to be uh, the dots connecting or a feeling of flow. So when I'm making a decision, I'm thinking about it. It's just open. Um, and so on and a couple of other people I've interviewed, I've interviewed now over a thousand people for the Intuitionology project. Uh, some of them actually see an orb, a uh, floating orb. And one CEO, uh, he, he's a CEO of a major uh, uh, custom clothing uh, shop in, in, in Canada. He sees this omen pop up. So if he's hiring someone or sees a business deal, and this omen comes up and there's no shape, there's no color, it just comes up, then he just stops what he's doing and accepts what is, is in front of him. Interesting. I'm going to hire that person. I'm going to bring on that partner. That's a deal. Uh, that's a vendor we're going to go with. It's just that cut and dry. He'll just stop all conversation. Is that a common phenomenon you've heard in your interviews? Well, so this, this is where we get into, because there's no, no definition, all of our signals are very unique. So so this, this, the dots connecting may be the right ones for me, but for you, it could be the same or it could be different. And so this, so every interview I have, um, I start with one of the first questions I ask every interviewee is what's your definition of intuition and what are your intuitive signals when you're trusting your intuition and, and ignoring your intuition and everyone's, there's going to be some common ones that they talk about the gut feeling, the voice or something's off. So there's some common ones, but there's some really unique ones. Um, and so when you get into the negative intuitive signals, the negative intuitive signals for me are kind of like the, the, the uh, hairs in the back of my neck kind of going up or, or just really knowing something's off, like there's something's really, really off. Uh, and I had one interview, an entrepreneur I interviewed, and he didn't know what his signals were. And he says, Sunil, I'm not sure. I've never thought about intuition with signals before. But yet when he started talking about the failures that he had in his businesses, he started grabbing his left earlobe. And he kept doing that. Every venture that he talked about where he got into it for the wrong reasons, he's talking his, to his left, it, he's grabbing his left earlobe. And he says, Sunil, I just realized what my intuitive signal is. My left earlobe gets hot. And now he recalls that when he got into those, those businesses, his left earlobe kept getting hot. And he recalls when he talks to his wife about those ventures, his left earlobe got hot. And so where we have to be careful with, and this is where we need to each do our due diligence on our signals is that you and I can share a signal. Let's say that's that voice. Let's just call it a voice and say sure. for you, that voice is signal number one. And for me, that signal is signal number three. If it's signal number three, what that means for me is that I've missed two signals. If I've missed two signals, I've made two bad decisions. And those bad decisions could be a stubbed toe or it could be that I'm headed towards bankruptcy. I don't know. And I really don't want to find out. Right. Interesting. And so when I started interviewing these thousand people, there were really kind of four groups of people that I found kind of came into sort of four buckets. The first group of people are the ones that absolutely believe in intuition and they run their lives on intuition. So I had a Buddhist monk on my podcast series and I had an intuitive channeler on, on there and they, they understand their signals and that's how they, they live their lives. The second group of people are the ones that kind of talk the talk, but they don't walk the talk. And they kind of talk about intuition. And a lot of people talk about gut feeling or the voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I want to live in the present moment. I mean, social media is filled with these themes of what people want to do or aspire to do, but they actually don't. Um, and, and so they don't, they don't really understand intuition, but they say, yeah, I'm being intuitive. I always follow my intuition. And there's this one fellow, Hal Eisenberg, uh, and he and I met because he was in the mindset space, uh, or so he thought. And I was in the intuition space. Uh, and so naturally, we kind of, you know, there's a natural intersection there. And then he saw me speak in Toronto. And that's when I talked about the intuitive signals. And there's four types of intuition, which I'll get into, and the four types of hurdles. And he was thinking, wow, yeah, I didn't realize that there were these signals attached to intuition. It was just really fascinating. And then a year later, this Hal de uh, develops a cough and he now knows that his intuitive signals were telling him to go to the hospital. Um, and he said, um, nah, it's just a cough, it's a fever. I mean, it's, it's nothing. What he didn't realize is he caught COVID-19. And a few weeks later, he was fighting for his breath um, and he almost died. In fact, he himself wanted to die. He had a life or death moment. He was choosing to die. And he said, Sunil, this was where he fully understood what intuition was. His voice told him, you are not done yet. You need to speak your truth. You need, your voice needs to be heard. You have great things going on. I'm going to let you live. 
and you're going to leave your decision free. Obviously, he pulled through out of it. Um, five days later, I was the first person he told about the details of what happened. He was my first podcast guest for my Intuitionology podcast series. Great way to kick off my series. Um, and he, he admits, I was talking that I would in mindset and trusting my intuition. I wasn't. I was. I ignored it. I made decisions. I said, ah, eh. you know. So he reflects back now. At of course now he's trusting his intuition, living his 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 uh, decisions out fully. But before he was, he wasn't even walking the talk. Here's a question I have for you. So is trusting your intuition always a good idea? And the reason I ask is because if you're on a winning streak, yeah, of course you want to trust your intuition. But on the other side of that, I'm sure there are people who uh, aren't where they want to be in life. And that's because they've always trusted their intuition in the wrong direction. So how do you reconcile that? So, and this is where we get into the four intuitive hurdles. And so let's jump to that. And so there's, sure. there's, there's four intuitive hurdles that impede your signals. They squash your signals. And the reason why your signals get squashed is that if you don't have a strong sense of values or a strong sense of purpose, mm -hmm. you don't trust mm -hmm. yourself. What happens is those signals are going to be coming in, but because you don't even trust yourself, they're, they're, they're showing their, uh, their, their face, so to speak. And then these four intuitive hurdles come and squash them down because you don't trust yourself. And so and the four intuitive hurdles are, and I'll go in terms of sort of severity. The one is, if you don't trust yourself, what happens is you hijack that, that amygdala. And that way you're way too emotional or you're way too rational. So in relationships, you get into relationships and you're way too emotional. You have the self-talk. No, no, I'm going to give him or her second chances, um, et cetera, et cetera. Even though your intuition has given second chances and is telling you to get out, your close friends that you trust are telling you to get out and you don't and you deny and all that. And so, and being too rational is, again, uh, my engineering, right? I drank the societal Kool-Aid, uh, even though I knew I, I should have been an entrepreneur, but I drank that. And so I was being too rational uh, and I wasted my time. Um, and then the other two are uh, ego and fear. Ego is one where um, you're actually, uh, there's two sides of egos. There's narcissism, of course. And then the other side of ego is, is following the herd. So you follow a group of people or you, you maintain a friendship just because, and you fill in that blank because they have, they wear brand names. They, they know important people. Um, you think that they're successful and you want to kind of have that, you know, want to be associated with them, but it's that intention and the values that rub you the wrong way. It rubs your intuition the wrong way saying you can't trust that person or, that person's intention is not really aligned with you. And so you start listening to people that don't have the right intention. And then you start going astray. Um, and the last one is fear. And there's, and there's three types of fear that you have. Fear of failure, fear of the, fear of the unknown, or fear of change. Mm -hmm. And now remember, we're coming back to the science where your intuition hits the amygdala. And there's, two type, there's only two types of fear. There's the fear that a saber-toothed tiger is going to be eating you. Mm -hmm. Or there's the fear that you just don't want to go in a new direction, but your intuition's telling you that it's the right one. And this is where you really need to pay attention and do the work on the inventory of your signals. And so if you know that your signal is a positive one because you've recognized it, that fear is because you haven't been in that direction. And what you have to do is you have to just walk through that, walk through that, and walk through that. And a great story is one of the, the guys I interviewed, his name's David Dame, and he's has, he has cerebral, cerebral palsy. All his life, he's been in a wheelchair. And the one dream he had was to go on the beach and just feel the sand in his toes and the, and the ocean water. So he goes on a vacation and he, he's about to fulfill his dream. His friends uh, take his wheelchair up to the edge where the water meets the sand and he gets up and he plants his toes and he falls flat on his face. And he says, Sunil, I have two things I can do at this moment. The first thing I can do is I can succumb to my fear, get back on that wheelchair, and forever regret that I never was able to come through with the dream I've always wanted to have. Or I can overcome that fear, trust my intuition to take the step, and then take the next step, and then take the other step. And that's what he does. And he points to his chin. He says, the water gets up to about here. And then he turns around and he hasn't realized how far he came. That's how, what happens to when you, when you come overcome fear. And when I'm, I'm also interviewing people 
And this, this thing is one of the, I wouldn't say common things that they ask, but certainly people think that they go through negative situations. But when I distill their story and listen really intently to how that story unfolds, what happens is it's always one of these four intuitive hurdles that attacks them at a place when they don't trust themselves. They don't have a strong sense of values that leads them down the wrong path. And a great uh, analogy is, is Mark Metry, Mark Metry who has the Humans 2.0 podcast. It's one of the top 100 on iTunes. He was on my show and he, was, he developed social anxiety and he almost took his life in high school. And he was telling me the story uh, and he, he talks, he says, intuition sometimes doesn't lead you in the right direction. And that he, he lied and he continued to lie and he lost himself in it and he tried to take his life. And I said, but Mark, if I was to rewind the podcast interview to the point where you started telling that story, uh, right after you said, sometimes in, intuition leads you down the wrong path. The next thing you said was that I knew I shouldn't have lied, but the moment you said that statement is exactly the moment that intuition told you you shouldn't have, but you did because of ego. He needed to lie to fit in mm -hmm. again and again and again. And he lost himself. He was nobody and he was going to kill himself. So when we look back at those people who have gotten into the bad situations, it's one of these four intuitive hurdles that have attacked them. They, they don't, and that's when they don't recognize those signals and they need to trust themselves, get back to what, what is their purpose? What do they really want to do in life? What are their values? Are they listening to people that they shouldn't be? Uh, you know, what, what's made them happy in life? What's made them fulfilled in life? And they've never bothered to stop and answer that question and then live every life walking one step at a time at a time and then living that life. So that's what happens when you live life based on intuition. I mean, I think we live in a society that kind of conditions people to follow the herd and never uh, look within to not, not just answer the questions, but even ask the questions in the first place. So what is the remedy to that? I mean, Everything you're saying makes sense, but how do you help someone become self-aware enough to even like address this situation? Yeah, so, th so there's two ways to do this. One is figuring out how you see intuition. Uh, and so what is it that, how do you really see it? How does it operate in your life? And of the th three groups I was telling you, I talked about the first two, the, the third of the, the four is basically you know, hitting rock bottom and finally realizing that intuition has been there. But the fourth group is, is, is making basically ones that were non-believers. And these are people that didn't understand what intuition is, didn't think it existed. Uh, and so one of my first interviewees was John Rothschild. And this is where we talk, I talk about the four types of intuition and the intuitive signals all coming together uh, through this analogy. So John was an investment banker. And so back in 2012, 13, I was telling you everything was spiritual and cosmic voices from you God. You said Rothschild, like Rothschild, Rothschild? Rothschild. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if this related in some way, <laughs> okay. but, but certainly he was Best a very banker, successful. Investment banker, Rothschild, maybe. He was very successful in Canada. He's a big, a very successful Canadian businessman that um, that ended up retiring uh, at the time that I that I um, interviewed him. But because he's like data and analysis and research ruled every part of his life, intuition being a voice from God is going to say, uh, yeah, that does yeah. not exist. Yeah. So he gave me an hour's worth of his time. He says, I have no clue what we're going to talk about, but we'll talk about intuition for five minutes. And the rest of the time, let's just have a latte and catch up. I haven't seen you in a while. So the cameras are on and I'm telling him, yeah, intuition comes through signals like omens and stuff of like that. And he's saying, Oh, you know what, Sunil, I really, I could wish uh, I'll shake the hand of the guy who sees omens. Um, yeah, you know, intuition, I make business decisions. There's, it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't play any role. Um, and then he says it's based on data and experience. And I said, well, John, one of the four types of intuition is actually called experiential intuition. Mm. And so what happens over time is when you're born, you have all these experiences around you that get put in the subconscious area of your brain, like a library. And if you look at the, the subconscious and conscious, like an iceberg, the subconscious 90% below water, 10% right. is the conscious. So there's this library of information, experience, learning, and uh, experience, both good and bad, uh, formal and non-formal, street smarts, book smarts, and the experience of others that you find relevant that all go into this library. So when you make a decision, your intuition plucks all the specific pieces of, of data you need and information for that decision in a split second. So you're already informed 
that sure. when it signals to you, it's the right decision. So we shouldn't be feeling fearful because we've already got some basic skills that intuitions already told us that they pulled apart and forward. Is what you're saying that that sometimes your intuition processes so fast, you might not even attribute it to intuition. You think you're making a logical decision, but in reality, it's your experiences kind of guiding the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're talking about 200 miles per hour and library that's, that's uh, nanoseconds that's being, it's being pulled. So when I, when I was telling John about the experience and one of the things I said is John, sometimes your intuition will help you go against the data. And he says, wow, I got an experience like that. And I said, well, tell me about it. So this, so John was in the business of putting in franchise restaurants. Sure. And he used a benchmarking system. So nine out of 10, they would put a, a franchise in. That's based on traffic patterns, development in the area, et cetera. So him and his partner walk into this, this dilapidated area of Toronto, which was a five and a half out of 10 that his team put in. And now we're getting to the second type of intuition called situational intuition. They're looking around this place and they said, you know, John says, I don't know, but I think we should be putting a franchise location here. And his team was mad at him. I mean, come on, it's a five and a half out of 10. It's not even like a, a at 8.8. And, and he said, no, I think we're going to put one. And they do. And that becomes one of the best franchise models called the beer market under his portfolio of restaurants, the most profitable by far. Here's the question I have for you. So yeah. when I hear something like that, I know this conversation is about intuition as opposed to the numbers and the data. Yeah. But is that an anecdotal example of the intuition playing out better than the data? I guess what I'm asking is what is the data on intuition driven decisions? If that makes sense. Yeah. So, so if it's data driven decisions, uh, there's something called creative intuition. I was just about to get into it. So sometimes if your creative intuition is high, what that is, is it gets you to make decisions that are so obtuse that it goes against the data, but it's the right decision for that situation. Sure. If the, if the creative intuition is low, then it's basically a data-driven de- decision that is right for that situation. Uh, and I'll give you another example as well. One of my colleagues is uh, vice president for 3M Canada at that time. He's moved on. You know some there. pretty cool people, man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and so... I brought this thing again about intuition and going against the data. And this is a guy, so he was in the medical device area and responsible for operations. He's been an operations guy for 30 years. All he knows is process. And there was a way to package um, a certain medical device that was losing money. I'm sorry, to interject. you know how I know yeah. he's, a, he's an operations guy. Cause he says process and not process. <laughs> oh yes. A hundred percent. I'm, I'm an operations myself and our yeah. VP of ops, Process, process, process. What the fuck is a process, bro? It's a process. I'm sorry. Please continue. No problem. Uh, and so, so, but based on his 30 years of experience, his 30 years experience, packaged um, uh, medical devices uh, in a certain way every single time. That's all he knew. But this one way of packaging was losing money, and his intuition was saying, "Well, we should be packaging this totally different, like almost 180 degrees to what we're doing." And when he asked his engineering team to package it in a different way, and then all the processes behind that to, to, to basically make sure that that packaging happens, that per unit became profitable. Wow. Going against his 30 years of data, but figuring out that, yeah, the data told him to package this way, but if we used it another way, then it became so profitable. Was, was the data suggesting that way of packaging not strictly from a monetary perspective from a different perspective because yeah because, yeah because he was yeah and it's the way the packaging was in terms of unit cost so taking it out of the box and so it was it, before packaging was in sort of uh, bigger boxes and then there was a distribution network and it was becoming uh, a bit too expensive without getting into so the the, the details and i'm going to bore sure. your bore your listeners but what they had to do is actually break apart the boxes and package them differently in units to to distribute to hospitals in smaller quantities and then what would happen is because they were in smaller quantities, they were able to meet the demand faster, which means that they would reduce the route uh, time in the routes, which means Got reducing it. man hours, person hours, gas, and all that stuff. So we're now getting to the little bit of the nitty gritty of all what factors happened. considered it was a net positive. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he had to break apart, uh, you know, instead of going, uh, you know, uh, 15 per package, he had to go four or five per package, but that takes a lot of re retooling and rerouting of the whole process line in getting it from 
bringing it into the, the front and then getting out the back. So this is a, it's a huge deal by making that one decision. So as part of your teachings to help people use intuition to take a more holistic view, as opposed to just a very narrow view driven by a specific data set? Absolutely. So, so you have to be driven by either purpose or goals. Uh, and that's, uh, and that's, that has to be there, but it's, it's the, in the actual walking towards that goal, uh, just like David Dame and trusting those intuitive signals that really kind of kind of move you ahead, right? And so what happens is then then you start making either the sort of the routine decisions that are data driven, or and in John's case when we talk about creative intuition, um, you know the one question I asked him uh, was John now that you now this guy is now an investment banker was there a decision that you made that was so obtuse that got you to go against the data? And he said, oh my god, and now. This guy's fully into intuition. He's getting it. Um, and he said that this, this guy's probably making three or $4 million a year as an investment banker, high-end restaurants, private jets, limousines. And he wanted, to, he wanted to run a tiny bankrupt little restaurant. And now we're getting into the fourth type of intuition called relational intuition. Hmm. All the people driven by money, fame, extrinsic motivation, all told him, what the hell are you doing? What kind of life, look at the life that you have. Mm -hmm. But they didn't care about whether he was fulfilled or not. He was fulfilled by getting, running this. He was tired of just being uh, a coach on the sidelines. He wanted to be a quarterback. He wanted to run a business. And as an investment banker, he was always on the sidelines. And the one person he trusted was his wife. And now I'm quoting from him. He says, this just feels right. There's a signal. He quits his job, rolls up his sleeve, walks into that tiny bankrupt restaurant. That restaurant ended up being the first location of Eastside Mario's. Mm. And he grew that Eastside Mario's location to over a thousand locations under different brand names. In 20 years before he retired, $2 billion in revenues. By the time he retired, and that was when I did his interview, all because of an intuitive decision. Those are the four types of intuition with the signals that happen from a non-believer. Now I've taken a, a non-believer to a believer in one hour because it's his intuition, his stories, his signals, his decisions that he made. And now he understands intuition. And so when we're educating those listening, they have to take the time to figure out what intuition is for them. What are their signals? What did they do in the past, good and bad? And what were those signals? And really take the time to distill that and so that they understand that when they make a decision, here's a positive signal, here's a negative signal. It just, it's, it's just that simple. And the problem is we, as you said, we follow the herd. We're in a society that we're, we're, we're listening to other people who don't have the right intention. And, or we're afraid to do that. And, and you know, it's, sometimes it's a lonely path, but who cares, right? Uh, for me, I, I've met thousands and thousands of people. You've already said some of the people in my, in my circle are, are significant, I, I guess so. But I have two people that I trust intimately in my inner circle. And uh, there's a, a possible third that I met. Actually, I uh, appreciate you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> What's the whiskey? <laughs> It's the whiskey, <laughs> but there's a third one. He, he was actually a podcast guest, uh, and I was on his podcast, and I was doing research for another podcaster, and and I reached out to him. But he and I somehow aligned. Uh, he's in London, England, and um, I think we're just at the starting stages. I feel intuitively, I think that this is going to be a good friendship coming up. So now I have three of the thousands and thousands of people, and I'm okay with that because it's quality. When I'm with these people, when I talk to them or respond to their texts. I just feel really good. It has to be not that we don't have to talk about anything academic. We, you know, we can laugh, we can tell stupid jokes. They understand me. One of them is totally different than who I am, but we just have this kinship. Um, and that's the way life should be. And the way I look at it is oh, yeah. this is my train. This is my path. Um, and if you don't like the path that I'm on, get off at the next station. And if you continue to bother me, I'm going to kick you off myself. Fucking love it. I, I'm really intrigued on what you would say to somebody that, you know, obviously there's the the, the bottleneck of, of identifying your intuition if you're like lacking purpose. Um, yeah. But for those that, you know, let's say just fly by on, you know, naturally following their intuition, 
how on like identifying those those triggers and maybe not looking too far into it and identifying you know where something that maybe isn't an actual trigger that may lead you in the wrong direction Mm -hmm. because somebody that hasn't really identified their intuition or made it a big part of their life might find false flags uh and and run themselves into yeah and 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 most most of the time well not most of them all every single time when they get into that situation there's always a moment where they know that they made an emotional commitment in the wrong way uh there's always that there's always something that's either they don't know their signals and they're just really put their values in other people's hands and so they're they're allowing other people to to pilot and co-pilot their life and they're lost they're just simply lost and they really need to first of all get up, get those people out of their life take back the train or the plane or whatever and start figuring out what the controls are uh, and and in some cases it's it's hard work because not only do you have to extricate yourself out of that dependency but now you have to gain dependency in, in yours and a lot of times that's two times the, the the work or more and a lot of people are are okay with that uh, because there's dopamine hits associated with, uh, and if you look at drug addicts, uh, or those people who are addicted to alcohol, I've had, I've interviewed probably six or seven of them. 100% of the time, their intuition knew that they were getting into it. Everything was a mask and everything has to come from within. Nobody, they can't help. No, they can't get help. It has to come from within. They have to get into tap into their intuition. They can call it something like, you know, they go to the 12 step program, talk about a higher power. Excellent. If that's what you need to get out of the, the habits that you're in. Fantastic. I mean, it's your language. Again, you figure you, you say what you want to really kind of get you out of that situation. I had one guy who was a gangster and he was being chased by some cops and he had like, like a bag of cocaine in his, in his, in his uh, um, pocket. And he just gets this intuitive hit. You're done. You're finished. He takes this bag of cocaine, throws it into some Lake uh, and he's done. And he's now teaching meditation. Uh, and he used to be, uh, yeah, I mean, and he was telling me of a time when he was in a hotel room and, uh, you know, there were guns coming out and a bullet went by his ear. And he almost got killed because it was a gang hit. Um, you know, that was his lifestyle. And now he's, he's teaching people to clean up on the beaches of Toronto and um, singing and, uh, and meditating and all that. Um, he didn't listen to his intuition. Yeah, when he didn't listen to his intuition, it, it was the gang lifestyle. And, and for some of those who get into that gang lifestyle, it's, it's their, their identity gets lost in other people. And again, the ex- external toys, um, but they learn, you know, when they come out of that, they learn when they reflect back. And remember, this is now when you go back to look at the, the decisions, good and bad. What did I really want from that? Uh, right. What did that really teach me? Uh, and did that really move my life forward? And so when they get into these sort of philosophical talks with themselves, uh, they quickly realize that, no, those weren't the people that uh, you know, th- it happened. Okay, it, it happened. But how do I prevent that from happening again? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what are the steps that I can I can take now to make sure I don't get into those relationships? Uh, and there's going to be different levels of relationship. I certainly have a lot of colleagues. I, I have a lot of friends, um, but then they're not as close in my inner circle. And I still enjoy my time with them because they serve a purpose when I want to go out and have a beer or what have you. You know, it's, it's still fun for me. Um, but I won't rely them on, on sort of my inner, my inner thoughts and guidance and, and actual, if I want advice, they're not the ones that are, that are going to give me advice with the right intention or expertise. That's going to lead me in the direction that is intentionally correct for me. Speaking of relationships, how has your work on intuition, intuition helped uh, people in intimate relationships? Because I've definitely been in relationships where, the girl's intuition <laughs> yeah. led to some issues. Like, I feel like you're cheating on me. No, the fuck I'm not. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. And, and so these are now past traumas that they've had where there's emotional triggers stuck. And so what happens is when we're stuck in past emotional patterns and behaviors, uh, what what I do with with the work on intuition is one of the things I do, and this is now coming back to fixing values and, and their purpose, is they go in the past and figure out <clears throat> why were they stuck in the past. If they had an abusive relationship, if they had episodes of cheating, then that their lens and filter will always be like that. And so when they see similar behaviors or even thoughts that they dream up of, that is, is they think, well, I, this, the only way I can explain this is because I can't. And if I can't explain it, then he I'm must be default cheating. to my old paradigm. Yes. 
And so, and so what I do with intuition, what I do with people that I work with one-on-one is I get rid of, and I use a bit of hypnotherapy and all that to get rid of that trauma to get them through and not to, not to minimize what happened. It happened, but let's not get emotionally stuck there and let's move on from that and just honor that that happened. But there were lessons that intuition learned from that, uh, you know, that's great. But then, you know, we shouldn't be judging other people based on those filters because the emotions aren't there again. Are, are people, I mean, I, I hate to be the person who says I don't believe in people, but yeah. I mean, from your experience, are people actually able to like rewire themselves when the trauma is that deep? So uh, it, it takes, it takes a while. And, and for, so if you look at it from a scientific perspective, whenever you rewire your brain and you want to go in a new direction, what happens, and, and there's, there's neuroscience showing this, is that your neurons, are, are, they've got sort of patterned pathways. And so when you go into a different direction, you change your habits suddenly, they actually do loosen and they're ready to get re, uh, you know, reconnected. But what happens is when you fall back to those patterns, it just falls back. And over time, it's harder and harder to loosen that. So what it means is when you get into a habit, in some cases, you have to go cold turkey to really rewire those brains. And more and more neuroscience is coming out to show that that's exactly what happens. Um, and, and I've heard a couple of neuroscientists on some of the other podcasts that, that are kind of in that space. And I'm trying to get them on the show so I can talk about this. So from a scientific perspective, it's absolutely possible to do that. But it's really hard because we have a lot of patterns of behavior uh, that we have to go. We have old ways of doing things. We, um, and to really break a habit, uh, it, it's, it's hard work. Uh, and you really, and again, you really have to trust yourself and pay attention to those signals. And a lot of times you've missed a lot of signals in the past. So there's a lot of work done to pick up on those signals and to continue to do that. And to, and sometimes you may have to just, you know, take a walk and, and think about what happened and how did it feel in the moment? But the more often that you do that, the more the, the, the signals come up, then they come up well before uh, a relationship will come up. Uh, a relationship problem or a signal will come up because something's off. And I'll give you a really good example. Um, I had this uh, one uh, person who um, uh, she was in the, in the swimwear business uh, and uh, she was launching a swimwear. And before she got, you know, some people had taken her for a ride and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a side business and it was kind of, it didn't have a huge cash flow. And there was this one guy that was, um, that was promising the world. It's going to take her brand international, had a big show in Miami, uh, lots of models coming, sponsors, and the whole bit. Um, and so we had had our session, and um, what we there was a new in intuitive signal that came out of that session that she never had uh, heard before. And so it was an, an uncomfortable signal. And so when this guy pops up on her radar, she gets this 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 signal that's like, uh, "This is weird. Uh, I just came off a session with Sunil, and I'm I've got this feeling that's just negative." Uh, in nature. And so she does, decides, and he's promising the world, all these other supporting models are going, other companies saying, yeah, let's go, or a business partner saying, yeah, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. And at the last minute, she pulls out because she's, she's and she's trying to explain it away, but ultimately she tells me her intuition is saying, don't go with this guy. Uh, he stiffed everybody. It, the models didn't get paid. The sponsors didn't get paid. He took off with the money. And had she had gone down there, her business was done because all of her cash flow went down on one event and she would have been, she would have been done. The same person now is sitting at her, so her own parents own this, uh, it's, it's a kitchen renovation store um, for high end units. She's sitting on this computer uh, doing some marketing. And so this is a part one of the business partners computers. And um, she gets this intuitive feeling to click on this, this file folder and she's never in her life would she ever have done that. This is somebody else's computer. It, it, just, it, it just goes against everything that she was thinking. But something was compelling her to open that folder. So she opens that folder. And what she finds is that invoices from this business partner of her family's that was billing the, uh, a whole bunch of companies in Toronto on the company letterhead or invoice, but collecting the cash personally. Wow. And had she not found out at that moment, uh, her whole 29 year business or 30 year business, her family had run since they had come to Canada was gone. And luckily they caught him. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, you know, they, they, they kiboshed the partnership. They lost a little bit of money because he already pocketed the, the cash and they decided to let it go. Um, 
But this is sort of now we're getting to sort of the power of intuition. And then even in her business, like she was selling, uh, you know, bikinis and all that stuff. Um, and she, she didn't have a purpose to her where, so she was flatlining. And it's, so what's, what's your real purpose? And I said, well, I want to save the planet and I really care about animals. And so, and so we, we talked a little bit about that and thought, okay, well, what if you kind of match your purpose with what you're doing with bikinis? And she let it sit for a bit. And then she got it. She got an intuitive hit that I'm going to make bikinis out of recycled fishnets. And so she decided to do that. Her customers actually went to one third, like it cut out two thirds of her customers. But of the customers that stayed, they bought five to six, six times more. She tripled the, the, the actual cost of the, of the, of the uh, bikinis. And she has now a tribe that keep coming of no marketing spend because they believe in what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And she now has a, a booming business just by finding her purpose driven by intuition. And so now you have a tangible benefit, a data point on something that's driven by something intangible called intuition. And there's tons of these stories. So these sessions of yours, I'm, I'm gathering, my intuition is telling me that uh, these sessions are pretty fucking powerful. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but can you walk us through like how these sessions go? Like, if you were to give me a mini session right now, yeah. how would we go about that? Because I, I don't, as I'm hearing you talking, yeah, trying to identify <laughs> my own triggers, I'm realizing that maybe I don't understand my own. Yeah. So, so th there's 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 a seven day challenge that I have people go through uh, on my on my website. It's free, by the way. Okay. Uh, and. I yeah, and I'll get you guys a link to it as well. But um, what, what it does is essentially takes, uh, it's, it's kind of a mini way of, of me taking people through a session in a bigger way. And with the seven day challenge, I get you to understand, okay, what problem do you want to solve? Start with that. Start with what problem you want to solve. What have you tried in the past? When you look at what you've tried in the past, now you're getting a basket of negative signals. Then the next thing you do is you put yourself in what I call an intuitive medium. Where do you go to think? Is it the shower just before sleeping? Is it just kicking up your feet and having a whiskey? Is it taking a walk? What is it where you go to sit and think and where there's no noise? And that's where you can, you're, you can think about what should I be doing? And then, and, and you start planning about how to solve that problem. Now you're getting a positive intuitive signals. And the important thing with the positive intuitive and doing it in that way is that if you're thinking about taking a step and it's not the right one, well, now you've done your homework on negative intuitive signals a negative intuitive signal is going to pop up. So uh, uh, that's not a path for you because mm -hmm. you've already got an inventory of negative signals. You discard it. So what you put down as a path to solve your problem are only those driven by your positive intuitive signals. Once you have that, who in your circle is going to help you solve that problem? It could be a mentor. It could be someone in your close circle. Uh, it's not yes people. These are people that you know are going to help you solve that problem. Then what environment do you put yourself in to solve that problem, if at all, if you have to change? And then you solve it. You take action. And in seven days, you do that. When I take What I take people through from a, a bigger perspective is that we, we don't look at their problem. We look at their life in the past. We look at their inventory that they do. Um, <clears throat> and once we've got their inventory signals, then we really take a their, look at their relationships and who do they need to cut out? Um, and you got to make some tough decisions and you don't want yes people. And even if it gets down to one or you have to start from scratch, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. This is where you need to really surround yourself with the right people who are going to support you um, in the thick of, uh, of things that are going to move your life forward. Then what do you have to do? Do you have to move? Do you have to change your environment? What in the environment do you need to change? Uh, and then what's your plan? And so we take that at a very higher level and look at the past trauma because a lot of times there's that past trauma and we'll work on that because there's two or three things that they, we need to kind of get them out of. Uh, and then that gets them uh, <clears throat> moving further. If they have problems moving ahead again, then we go back and work on their values again. Uh, what, what's their purpose? Uh, and then align them that way. So that it basically takes you through a really, really big session. But for, for if you take the seven day challenge, that's a really good, uh, way of really getting a good kickstart into you, what your intuition is. And then just ask, ask in the past, when were you happiest? When were you most proud of yourself? And when were you the most fulfilled and why? And what were you doing? What, were, what led you to do that? Because that's a window into your values early on and your purpose early on, or even now, uh, because that can change. 
But when you're aligned with your purpose and your values, then you crowd out those intuitive hurdles because they have no way to affect your signals again. And once they're done, every decision you make now is guided by an intuitive signal. There's nothing to impede it. And that's how you walk in your life with your, uh, uh, with your uh, intuition. And it so, doesn't, and there's no fanfare. It doesn't have to be fanfare. You just keep your head down, you walk your purpose and you create one door after another in terms of opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And you're internally happy. It has nothing to do with external rewards, but they come. When you take care of the inputs, the outputs always take care of themselves as long as you trust your intuition. I love how you, you oscillate back and forth between the intuition guy and the engineer. It's poetic. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so I have a good question. So um, would you attribute just the, the lack of following the intuition or the voice in your head, so to speak, uh, to some people just driving themselves, let's say like into the ground, like, uh, like the addict that, that uh, was being chased by the cops and just, you know, realized he was done. Or I've got a personal friend that got shot, like I think 26 times by cops, you know, he was an addict, uh, had to end up amputating several legs and then became um, a gold Olympic gold medalist for the Paralympics and yep. speaks on stages all over. Um, would, reaching that point, do you believe that there's like a paradigm shift where it, those subtle keys and the intuition kind of becomes available to them and they're able to actually grasp that and make that mo movement forward and grow from there. But you, do you see where they avoid it and then crash and burn and then somehow they kind of are able to come back up and be able to actually see those things? Yeah, and in some cases people <clears throat> people don't realize that intuition is always there and they need to hit rock bottom to have that happen. And this is a common one. Um, I've had someone else who's a Paralympic um, athlete and he, he uh, was riding bikes and doing bike jumps and he knew he shouldn't have that the very morning he got up he, he knew this is an off day i should not be jumping he jumped and he ended up in a wheelchair um someone else was uh 12 years old stacy copas was jumping in a pool and her aunt was saying don't do that you're gonna break your back jumped in straight down and snapped her spine uh and so <clears throat> these are people that either are trying to <clears throat> uh, mask some kind of pain um, trying to attach themselves to somebody else or a gang or something where there's no identity. Uh, so they, they trade off their identity for someone else and they keep going down the rabbit hole, down the rabbit hole, down the rabbit hole. And they mask feeling self-worth from other people. <clears throat> self-worth is being in that ego, in having the, the stuff. And many of them, the, the people in the gangs and many of them in those situations, when we reflect on them, uh, reflect on those situations, they themselves are the ones to know that it's been, it's wrong. They are the ones to know that they're masking some type of pain. They are the ones to know that they know that this is wrong, but they're going to do it anyways. And in some cases they have to hit rock bottom to the point where the only thing they can think of is they're going to live or die. And so if you look at the Paralympics, um, <clears throat> the Paralympic uh, athletes uh, in both cases, they were in a hospital and they said, what now? And they both wrestled with suicidal tendencies because their life was over. But they had an intuitive moment to say, okay, but my life is kind of not done yet. And so what do I do? And now they've realized that, and this is subconsciously, the power of intuition is coming in because now the choices they make get them to excel and become a Paralympic speaker or a Paralympic athlete and then a speaker on stages and become inspirational but they're just like you and I. There's nothing different. We both have arms and legs and a brain. They just realized that there's a point that they got to trust. I'm saying trust their intuition. They're taking the right decisions, uh, making the right choices to excel and, and be uh, hyper productive. But we all have that ability. Mm. We that, all have that ability. That we just have to do. Yeah. On the shoulders there. <laughs> It's just, when, when are we going to make that choice? For them, they had to make that choice. It's either die or live. And they were put in that situation because of really bad decisions. But for most of us, we aren't put in that situation because we're still floating around life, right? And we don't realize we're not in a situation where I'm going to die or live. Uh, we're just going about life. And the more you go about life not trusting your intuition, it's a huge waste, and it's, it's, I always say it's two times the cost. There's this thing called opportunity cost I consistently talk about. Mm -hmm. It's not just the cost of the bad decision. It's also the cost of you 
not making the right decision. And that's two times the cost. Very, very good example. Uh, a fellow that I interviewed, Vin Jang, this guy from, he speaks to hundred thousand people every year, 80 stages. He used to be a professional magician. Now he talks about communication and he, he was living downtown LA, the high life cars, you know, around the right people. Uh, so he thought, and he felt like shit inside. And so he went to New Zealand he, and he put out all these, uh, you know, these pieces, these notes on, on the wall of what he values, what does his friend value, his parents, this and that. And when he looked at all these things, he said, well, this is what my mom wants. This is what my wife wants. This is what my friends want. This is what society wants. Where am I? Where am I? And he quickly rips off all these pieces and he puts what he wants. And so he comes off this huge cathartic event in New Zealand goes back to LA <clears throat> and gets back into the same lifestyle, mm -hmm. gets sucked back into the vortex of extrinsic motivation and the same people, because he forgot to get rid of all those people. He forgot to get, you know, live in the moment. He forgot to live on intuition. And six months later, he redoes the whole exercise. And then he makes uh, the, uh, the decision to move from LA to Australia, where he's from. Nice. So when we had that discussion, I said, well, Vin, his name's Vin Jang. I said, it wasn't just the six months that you last, that you lost. It was also the six months that you didn't gain by fixing yourself. Mm -hmm. So you actually, my friend, lost one whole year of your life. And since you're in the business of helping 100,000 people a year improve their lives, how many people did you leave behind? Oh. And he just said, I've never thought about it like that. And it was just a, it was a sign. It was just a moment of silence, deep. That's what happens when you don't listen to intuition. Very simple. Mic drop, man. I, exactly. We would drop the mic, but we have a final question for you, but yeah, man, you got some, you got some good shit, bro. I am. Thank you. Hey, uh, but we are coming up on time though. So before you drop the mic, we got one final question for you. Right. I already know, like, just like the relationship between the subconscious and unconscious mind, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So we definitely want to make sure that uh, our listeners give you a follow and, and continue to uh, learn from your work. But before that. we start promoting your stuff, our final signature question is, uh, you know, we are the Dedication to Excellence podcast. So Sunil, in your own words, what does it mean to live a life in dedication to excellence? When you live a life dedicated to excellence, you are like a ripple in the water. You create the one drop and it affects everyone else and becomes a wave. You can call it a wave, you can call it a butterfly effect, but you affect so many people with your positivity. Uh, and when you trust and honor your intuition, you attract people like that and you teach them a lesson. And when you do that, every step you take is in the right direction. And then you never live a life of regret because you've just left a legacy that you want to be remembered for. You know, I would say mic drop, but I, I have to add to that because to, to illustrate that point, I just had the craziest experience happen to me last night. Uh, a girl that I met one time, maybe eight years ago, randomly reaches out to me on social media and says, hey, this is probably going to come off weird as hell but you've been in my dreams every night for the last three weeks. I've been going through the darkest moment in my life. And I don't even know what it is. We haven't even gone to the details yet. She said, but every night in my dreams, you were appearing to me and talking me through it and helping me. And I don't, we met once years ago through some mutual friends. I, I don't even really know what you do. I don't know you like that, but what, whatever you said, Sunil, like that example just came to my mind because yeah. it, it is that ripple effect that, we are having that impact on the world, yeah. whether we realize it or not. And people are watching. And even if they're not intentionally watching, they're subconsciously watching. So we can, we can drop the mic simultaneously together, brother. Mm, boom. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Sunil, man, we appreciate you for stopping by. Uh, uh, remind the people where they can follow you in your journey. Absolutely. There's intuitionology.com. Um, I guess you guys will have links to the seven day challenge um, in your show notes, um, or I can, uh, you can go there and get the seven day challenge. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, 
uh, Twitter. I'm going to try my, uh, my, uh, uh, my thing at TikTok. I'm not going to dance because if I dance intuitively, people are not <laughs> going to follow me for sure, but I'm going to be dropping some, no- dropping some knowledge bombs there. They can DM me. They can send me an email, snail at snailgodsy.com. Happy to answer any questions. Um, and uh, yeah, that's everywhere I'm available. We- we've got to get you on clubhouse. I'm on clubhouse as well. So I got sucked into, I got sucked into a bunch of relationship uh, ones and ended up being 90% intuition and 10% relationships. And all of a sudden I didn't get invited anymore uh, <laughs> because I was taking over the, uh, like, and I, I felt bad. I mean, oh, another, Oh, another question, intuitive signals. I thought this was about online dating, but okay, I'll answer it. Um, and, and there's also, of course, my podcast series and, and uh, you know, people can listen to me there, but yeah, clubhouse I've tried. I've got to really be careful my marketing team has already screamed at me that uh, I haven't been putting too much in thing and con- we're in content creation mode and uh, getting on clubhouse. They, they don't really like that uh, with me. So I'm going to be very specific about and very intentional about getting on clubhouse. So. That's hilarious, man. Well, Hey, wherever you go with this message, my intuition is telling me that it is going to go far because it, it is a message that uh, people need to hear. So again, brother, we appreciate you for stopping by continued blessings. Uh, best of luck to you. We look forward to watching your, career continue to skyrocket and with that uh appreciate everyone for listening in we'll catch you on the next episode stay blessed if you haven't left us a review already shame on you leave us a review we'll holla at you later peace